um, I thought we'd get started, but um, before we do, let me ask you a question. Have you noticed when you go to technical conferences that most, most sessions start the same way? Right? There's a slide that's up when you walk in the room and the speaker starts off by reading you the title of the slide on Beyond Testing. And then they introduce themselves, right? They've got a slide, it says who they are, what they've done, some kind of certifications or, or social things to tell you, yes, I know what I'm talking about and I should be up here talking to you. You ever wonder why they do that? Nobody? I wondered about it, right? Um, pardon? That's true, that's true. Um, but I think there's something else. When you're watching a TV show and there's a commercial break, when you come back from the break, nothing important ever happens in the first 30 seconds or so. And it's because they're giving you time to settle down and get back into the story and be ready for it, okay? I think speakers do this for a similar reason. It gives you a chance to understand how I speak, right? My pacing, my tone, that kind of thing. It gives me a chance at the same time to get a little more relaxed because getting up here in front of a lot of people can be very stressful for folks. Right? But I get a chance to talk to you about something I don't even have to worry about you understanding. Right? So I think that's what it is. And so far, no speaker has told me no. So that, that's my solution for the moment. But so this is me and more proof. Um, I have two articles in each of these books. Uh, and if you want to play Where's Waldo, my picture's in the top row of, of each of those. And they're very tiny, but you know, that's an open source book sort of. You can actually find the articles in there online as well. So when I started putting the talk together, I had to figure out who I was talking to, right? Because if I gave the talk to people who weren't interested, it'd be kind of a waste of both our times. So my thought is you're probably a JavaScript programmer, but you don't have to be a JavaScript programmer because this talk is applicable to just about any language. And I'm figuring it here for a couple reasons. First of all, you have some interest in automated testing, and the second is, you want to learn how to deliver better code in less time, right? We have to do that. As that's really the, the, the holy grail, if you will, of what we want to do as developers, right? Um, yes, sir. I've got, I've got both mics on. Yep. That's a critique. I'll let him know about the, the criticisms we had. So the goals for this talk is really simple. I want to help you deliver better code in less time, and I've got three ways of doing it. First is understanding that unit tests are necessary but not sufficient, right? Automated unit tests are a really good thing. Don't let me steer you wrong on that. Um, but it's not really enough to do what we want to do. Uh, you also need to look at your feedback loops. And we'll talk more about those in a little bit. And the last thing is you want to go beyond just testing. Okay, that's why the title on beyond testing. So part of this is it's a matter of perspective, how you see things. And to help get you sort of in the right frame of mind, I wanted to show you something that I think is pretty interesting. It's this thing. It's called a Necker cube, uh, after the guy who first discovered it, I think. And if you look at it, you can kind of see a white wireframe cube on top of some black circles, yes? You see that? Okay. But there's something else you can see, okay? If you think about that white area as being a surface with holes in it, and there's a black surface behind it. And you can look through that surface and see the cube behind the white surface. Can you see that? Right? The fun part is nothing has changed between that screen and your eyes. You're still getting the same signals. But because of the way you're thinking about it, you're seeing something completely different. Okay, so how you think about something changes what you see and what you perceive. And when I first saw that, I went, oh man, where else is that happening in my life? Well, if I looked at things, you know, took a slightly different perspective and looked at it again, I'd see something different. Or if I were able to just change how I think about something, I'd see something different. And this is important because what we think and what we see turns into what we believe and how we behave. And part of moving beyond testing is going to take a change in the way you perceive things. And we'll see some more about that in a sec. But before we do, we need to get a few things straight. Uh, as developers, we like to have definitions. We like to know what we're talking about. So the first thing is manual testing. Um, for purposes of this talk, manual testing 
there's a process where a human has to be involved. Some person has to look at the results and be involved. And this is an issue because how well the test happens depends on what they know and what their opinions are. It also depends on, uh, on them being uh, very detail-oriented. It's slower and it's error-prone because if you're tired and you're trying to do manual testing, you're going to miss things. If you're stressed, if you're in a hurry, you're going to miss things. Okay, so manual testing, while useful, is also slow and error prone. That's, that's kind of a bad thing. And as programmers, one of the things we like to do is automate manual processes, right? So automated testing is about taking that manual process and giving it to the computer. Let the computer do the work, right? Why should you have to do all this laborious, boring, repetitive, detail-oriented stuff when you could spend your time doing more interesting things? So I say it should be based on project requirements. Um, because if your automated tests are based on your implementation, how you're doing things as opposed to what it's supposed to do, they become brittle. And that's one of the biggest complaints people have about writing automated tests is, oh, the, tests, the, code, the code's too brittle when I do that. And if I change my, my program, I have to change all these tests. Um, and we'll see ways around that. So fast and accurate is the key. Right? Give it to the computer. It'll do the same thing every time. It's going to do it in a fraction of a second, and you're going to get the same results. If you don't, there's something wrong with your test. Right? You're, you're, um, if you've been on any of the other tests, normally we're talking about unit tests at this point. right? So your, your uh, object under test should be disconnected from anything in the outside world. So you're giving it the scope. You're giving it the variables. The results should be repeatable. If it's not, you need to learn to write better tests. So. Historically, software has been a fun thing to develop. It looks something like this. You get requirements. You do some analysis on it, figure out what you need to write. You write that code. Then you test it. You find some bugs, so you fix them. Right? And that's your first, sorry, that's your first uh, feedback loop. Right? And the feedback loop is some process where you get information that you can make a decision about and then go back and make things better. Uh, common feedback loops are, I'm hungry, so I go eat something, and I feel better, or I'm still hungry, so I eat some more. Right? Or if you're driving, when you were, if you were, well, most people learned how to drive, and when you first did that, right, you did a lot of long jerks, and, and because you weren't used to it, and your brain had problems um, dealing with all the input. After a while. You're doing the same thing, but you're getting a lot smoother because you're making you're getting your feedback loop is tighter. You're making tiny adjustments, and so it seems like you're going in a straight line, even though you're really not. Right. Um, so this is a feedback loop, and we'll we'll look at how to how to reduce these. But once it's good, you've done your test, you turn it over to QA, and they find bugs, and it goes back to you for analysis and the fixing until you're ready to return it to QA again. So then you get it to user acceptance testing. They find bugs, and it goes back through. And so it's, it's a recursive kind of a process, too. But eventually, you get to release it out to production where people find bugs, and you go back to the beginning. It's a little depressing if you look at it like that. And, and when I first wrote this up, I was like, wow, I can't believe I used to do that. Um, but that's the way it was for a long time. But then we got to what I'm calling an early modern process. Um, not where we're at now, but better. It starts out pretty much the same way. Uh, but then they've got this other step in here of writing automated unit tests. And that was a big deal when it first came out, because now we had the computer doing some of this stuff for us. Uh, the problem was uh, the timing of it. So you would work on the code. You'd manually test it. Everything's working. So now I'm going to write my unit test. And it's boring. It's, it, the, the problem here is, um, first, the code is hard to test because it wasn't written to be testable. Second, there's no short-term benefit for the programmer who's doing it. Right? So you've, done all, you've written all this code. You've gone through manually to make sure it works. And now you're going to write code that does what you just did. And so your brain says, why in the world am I wasting my time with this stuff? Right? Uh, I could be doing, fixing some more bugs. I could be writing new enhancements. I could be off doing something else completely. But if you do it, then you get this, this group of regression tests that make sure that the bug that you just fixed isn't introduced again. 
So there's long-term value, but the short-term is, is not there, and so it's really, really hard for developers to want to do. But that's, that's the feedback loop, and then you've got the rest of it that normally happens. Um, so people looked at this and went, wait a minute. Why am I manually testing if I've got this automated test here that's going to find it? I have to write the test anyways, so why am I manually testing? So they dropped that. And that shortens the feedback loop, right? Um, now you're writing the code, writing a test, and then fixing any bugs, making it pass, pushing it off to QA, and all the rest of it. The benefit here is uh, you don't spend a lot of time manually testing everything because you write the code to make it work. And so you start thinking about, well, I've got to write a code. I've got to write the code to make this work, so I want to be able to test it. So your behavior changes slowly, right? Um, then they got the idea of test first programming where they switch the order. Write the test first, then write the code. And this was a little bit harder because when you had the code and you were working with the, and, and you had to write tests, you could look at the code and decide what test you needed, right? But now they're saying write the test first and then write the code. And people are saying, well, wait a minute, how do I, I don't know how to write the test first. And the answer for that was kind of frustrating, but true. And it was, well, if you don't know what test to write, you don't know what code to write, right? Or if you know what code to write, you should know what the test for that would be. And it's kind of like getting a poke in the eye when you're asking, you know, how do I start this difficult process? Um, but that was the deal. And people got over it, and they started writing tests first, and, and things worked. And they started writing a lot of tests, way more than before, because now they were getting benefit from it. Right? By writing the test first, you're actually designing the code that you want to use. So uh, it's easier to write them that way because you're doing top-down development instead of bottom-up. Uh, the other thing is uh, you also, because it was easier that way, people wrote more tests because now they got some value out of it. Well, now they're writing a bunch of tests and they've got a bunch of production code, so they've got all this code to maintain, and there were issues with that. So they came up with this. Sorry. I got I to gotta make sure I'm looking this way. Um, so, write the code, write the other test, yes, find the bugs. Um, so they came up with the process, and uh, I'm going backwards, that's what it is. <laughs> All right, so at this point, we're doing the test first, and they're finding fewer bugs, which is good. So then came along this idea of test driven development because. Um, like I said, they're writing all this code, and they've got to maintain it, and it's getting kind of ugly. So test-driven test development came along and had this process slightly changed. You write a failing test, you write the code, and you refactor, red, green, refactor. You guys are familiar with TDD, the whole thing? OK. Um, this worked really well, too, right? because by the refactoring process, the code got cleaner. You write a test. You write the code that makes it work, you refactor. So now you get rid of duplications in your test code, you get rid of duplications in your pro uh, production code. So the code becomes cleaner. Um, and, mm, sorry, test becomes cleaner, code becomes cleaner, and there's more benefits here. So you're getting fewer bugs too, because as you write cleaner code, the bugs that are there are easier to see. You're thinking about, how do I design this? What are the edge cases? What are the corner cases I need to be thinking about? Because you're doing design work here as you're writing these tests ahead of time. So then they started looking at this, this turnover process to QA. Well, we're doing agile development. There really shouldn't be a separate QA team, right? The, test, the developers are testing their own code. So the recommendation was pull QA in to the development process and don't make it a separate step, because that's another feedback loop. And so that really got changed to this, this idea of using a continuous integration server, right? Um, you guys are all doing continuous integration? Yes, some? Good. All right, so you check in your code, and this thing builds everybody's code, combines it, runs all the tests. If you're lucky, it deploys it and runs all the, the, the runtime tests as well. Um, and this process speeds things up. You get feedback quicker. You can see every time you check in the code, is it working? Can somebody else start using it? Right? So this is the TDD process. Um, 
But people still had questions about how do I how do I really do TDD? How do I do test driven development? So you guys know who this is? No, this is this is Robert C. Martin, sometimes called Uncle Bob. He's uh, he's big in the Agile movement. He was one of the guys who actually was a, a signer of the original Agile Manifesto. Um, he has a lot of good things to say. If you if you're not familiar with his work, this book, Clean Code, uh, talks about what is clean code? Why is it useful? Why do you want it? And how do you get it? Right? He's got a second book called The Clean Coder, which is more about the individual and from your viewpoint, what's, what's the benefits? What do you need to do? But he came up with something called the three laws. And this is different from Asimov's three laws of robotics. Right? This is Uncle Bob's laws of TDD. And they're very simple. Right? First one is no production code gets written without a failing test. Second one is you cannot write more production code than it takes to make that test pass. And the third one is, you, sorry, you can, the second one was you can't write more of a test than is necessary to get something to fail. Right? So don't go writing all these tests, just write one test that fails. And, and compiling errors, well, in JavaScript we don't have compiling errors, but um, an error where the object doesn't exist is enough. Right? That's a fail. So then you have to go out and create the object that you're going to call or the function that you're calling. But you leave it empty because it's not supposed to do anything yet. And then you go back and you write the next test. Third one is you can't write more production code than is necessary to make that test pass. And that's what I'm saying. You write just the empty signature for the function and now you can go farther and it'll fail farther down the line. And what this does is, this is actually from an article he wrote, um, it puts you into a very tight feedback loop about 30 seconds or so. And what that means is, first, okay, first, this is very extreme, okay? Uncle Bob was also big in the extreme programming movement. Um, but what this means is, if you write a piece of code, right, you write some stuff that should work, and everything goes haywire, it's not as bad as it looks, because if you hit Control Z a couple times and undo those changes, 30 seconds ago, you had working code. Right? So the error has to be in the things that you just did, or that has to be the trigger for whatever it was. You know exactly where to look. You don't have to go fire up a debugger. You don't have to go into the console and look for log messages. You know where it is. So it's like having a, a very uh, short slack line. If you're rock climbing or uh, doing any kind of like high-level work and you fall, you've got a rope that, that keeps you and catches you. Right? Well, that's what this is. That's how it works. It's like a safety net, but it's right there. You can't. You don't fall. 500 feet and get caught in the net, or 50 feet like some of the trapeze artists and all. It's a very short one. So 30 seconds ago, you had working code. Worst case, if you're following this and you, you do your write the code, write the test, write the code, refactor, and when it's done, check it in. If you've, if you've made several changes, you can just pull back that previous revision and you've got working code again. So this is a very, a very uh, um, kind of extreme way of doing it. But it also has very extreme benefits. And this is all about program productivity. Um, we're looking at ways to make you more efficient, get the code done quicker, get higher quality code. And really, there's a few factors here um, that are involved. So trustworthiness of your tests and the readability of tests, those improve the accuracy of the results, which helps prevent defects, which defects lead to debugging. And that reduces your product or activity. Right? So the more time you spend debugging, the less productive you are. I don't know if I don't know of anybody who enjoys being in the debugger. Right? It, it, mean, it means you've got a problem that you can't figure out logically. And and that's an issue. Um, the other part of it is the readability of your tests, right? Help to avoid debugging or help prevent defects, which goes back to reducing your your productivity and the speed of the test execution. This is one of the reasons why unit tests are supposed to be decoupled from everything else. If you have to hit the database, or you have to hit a service, or you have to hit anything, your tests run slower, which means it takes you longer to get that feedback, and therefore your productivity goes down. Um, so that's where all this comes from. Uh, so TDD sounds pretty simple, right? Three rules, it's easy. But people still say, no, I don't get it. It's, it's hard. And the biggest question when I've taught this to people and shown, shown it to them, I get one question more than anything else. Right? It's red, green, refactor. What's the problem? What's the question? Come on, you guys know. What's the first question that comes to your mind? 
where do I get started? Right? It goes back to how do I know what test to write? That's where, uh, this is test-driven development. That's where this comes in, behavior-driven development. So this is sort of an addition to, it's not a replacement for, but it's an addition to. And if you look, you can see there's a few things that are changed here. Ah. Hmm. Um, we're talking about specifying expected behavior. You've got a failing spec instead of a failing test. Uh, you write a failing specification, write the code to meet it. So this is very much like the, like the TDD part, except we're not talking about tests now, we're talking about specifications. So this is where the perception changes. Instead of writing a test that says, this is what my code is doing, right? I'm writing a specification, a future thing that says, this is what the code should do. Right? And that's why if, you, if you've been in some of the, some of the uh, uh, earlier sessions, you'll see the, the BDD frameworks have description and some text about what the thing is supposed to happen. And then it'll say it, and you put in should do this, it should not do that, like given this, uh, context, when this event occurs, then this should happen. Right? So you're setting it all up as to what the expected behavior of the system is as opposed to, here's the behavior I have, just make sure that that comes out when I get these, these inputs. Okay? So it's a subtle shift, but it changes the way you think about it, and it'll change the way you talk to your, your, the business people about it too. Because you can take their business stories and ask for examples and take those examples and use those as your tests, as your specifications. You know, if I'm doing a, a book purchasing system, online books, right? And they say, well, you know, if you spend $35, we give you free shipping. Okay, that's something you can actually put into a, a specification and say, you know, given I'm buying these online books, if I've got $35 worth of books in the, in the, the shopping cart, then I get free shipping. And they say, right, and that is not, it's not a brittle test, okay, because it's a business rule. It's not going to change unless the business rules change, and most businesses don't change their rules that often, right? So you don't have to worry about, okay, I'm writing these tests, but how, I'm, how often do I have to change them? How often do I have to fix them? You fix them when the business changes how they do things, right? The other part is you can take the output of those, the, the part that says description and the given when and then, the it should do this. There are tools that will take those bits out and turn them into a report. And you can show them to the business people. This is what the code does. Is that right? And they'll say, yeah, or no, you forgot. It's, it's $35, but it's gotta be $35 of books that we sell, not that we're, sending, not, not that we're shipping through another vendor. Right? If it's going to a third party vendor that's, that's using our website, like Amazon does, right? that doesn't count toward the 35. Oh, okay. Now you've got a better conversation going on with them. At this point, they're becoming more partners than people who just give you orders. Right? They understand that you understand what they're talking about, which means they trust you more. And trust is a key thing as a developer. So test-driven looks like this, right? It's a nice tight circle. Behavior-driven looks more like this, where you write the failing, it says test here, but it's really a specification. You write the failing spec first. That may lead to one or more uh, uh, unit tests that you have to write. Okay, but when you're done and you check that in, you have something that's deployable because you have a business rule that now works. Okay, and that's a key toward business agility, right? Businesses have to be able to, to deploy things more and more often uh, because the, the pressures that they're under from competition get in there, right? So by, by doing this, you become more agile, you become more in line with the business needs, which makes them happier with you and, and can lead to more success. So, quick, com quick comparison, TDD versus BDD. Test driven is about building, the right, building things the right way, right? Doing good design, doing good craftsmanship, writing clean code where it's highly cohesive and loosely coupled, all those kind of good things, right? Um, that makes it easier to understand and maintain, which means that you don't have to always be the person fixing that code, right? So effectively, that increases your bus number, right? Um, also means you can go work on other things and not get pulled back to a project because you're the guy who knows how that works. Um, BD takes all that and then adds the whole part about building the right thing. Um, I don't know if you've ever been on a, on a wonderful project where you, you got in there and you did the right stuff and you turned it over and they said, this is great, but it's not really what we wanted it to do. 
right? It's like, wow, that's, that's really demotivating. Um, and it goes to this. It, you've got two orthogonal things happening here. Um, the vertical is your quality, code quality, right? So if you have really bad code quality, it might work, but it, it's hard to maintain, it's hard to uh, update, it's hard to debug, it's hard for people to understand, right? But even if you get that up to the top, if it doesn't know what the business needs, it's considered a failure. So you need the other piece, the BDD piece, which goes horizontally, to make sure you're building the right thing. Because the, when you start using the business requirements and the examples as the things to drive your, your testing, then you know that what you're turning over is a value to them. If it's not, they should be, you know, they should be giving you different requirements or different examples. Right? So this way, you wind up, PDD is here, BDD is there, and it gives you a better shot at being up here in the business, business success quadrant. Right? So we're talking about specifications. And at this point, what that means is we have moved on beyond testing. We're not thinking so much about, I need to write a test. It's, I need to write something that tells people what this is supposed to do, and then make it do it. Uh, another nice benefit of this is, when the system's complete, or even as you're building it, what you've got is a set of executable specifications. These can be used to take that same process and put it on a different platform. Right? The same tests can run against other platforms. I'm go we've got a website, now we want a mobile device. Okay, It's still supposed to do the same things, right? all that business stuff. And you can then re-implement the low-level tests that make it work. If somebody gives you a new requirement and there's a conflict, it'll show up pretty quick because you've got all these specifications about how things are supposed to work and the new one comes in and disagrees. Okay, as soon as you write something that makes that work, something else breaks. So you'll find those issues. The other nice thing about this is when you onboard a new person to your team, you don't have to sit down for a day and a half and say, okay, so this is how this piece works, this is how this piece works. Um, you have all those specifications, all those tests that say, Set it up like this. When you feed these kind of values in, here's what it should return, right? Um, or when you when this happens, here's how the error handling is supposed to occur. Good developer can look at that and they know how to use your code. But really, what about the tests? So, anybody know who this is? Nobody. This is Bruce Lee, uh, and most people don't know it, but he was an early BDD adopter. And uh, he doesn't have any books on Agile or, or uh, automated testing, but we do have a little bit of a recording that tells you his thoughts about tests. Oh, and it's not playing. Let's try that again. It is like a finger pointing away to the moon. Concentrate on the finger, or you will miss all the heavenly glory. Okay. You, you couldn't hear it back there? I'm going to get close. We'll do this again. It is like a finger pointing away to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger, or you will miss all that heavenly glory. Does that work better? He says, it's like a finger pointing away to the moon. Is it? Ah, I missed that. All the prep and I missed it. Let's try that. <laughs> Better? So I can't say that this is necessarily heavenly glory, but if you concentrate on the tests, you miss out on the opportunity to look at the broader picture, to see the documentation, live, live documentation, which is always accurate, always up to date, because it runs against your code, right? If you ever had documentation that you couldn't trust, this is a way to get rid of that. You don't have to write a Word document. You've got 
this computer-generated information that says, here's all the rules, here's all that happens, here's the way it works. Right? Um, you've got cleaner code. You should be happier because you're wasting less time. Right? The business should be happier because they're getting the stuff they need faster with fewer defects. So hope I'm making a good case that this is a good process for you. Um, more things beyond testing. You can take your test framework, sorry, you can take your test framework and you can use it. If you get third party code, a library, an API that you need to use, you have to figure out how that works and how to use it in your code. Use tests to do that. Okay, a couple reasons for this. One, everybody else can see how it's done without having you sit down and walk them through it. Two, you take those tests and you keep them. And the next time that they give you a new revision, run those tests against the new rev, right, this new release. If they pass, you don't need to worry about the new revision. You can start using it. If they don't pass, you can find out, okay, is there something we can do here to make an, make, put an adapter in, right, so that we can still use that? Or no, we really can't. It's a breaking change that they've made to their code. We need to find something else. So you don't have that concern of, well, you know, we're using this library, but they've got a new release, and we'd like to use parts of it, but we don't know if it's going to work or not, so we've got to hold off and just use the same old stuff that's now five years old. Um, so, if you, if you guys are familiar with Selenium, or Jeb, or WebDriver, okay. If you use that to automate a web page, right, you can get to, and you're working on a website that, that takes several steps. I've got to log in, I have to pick a particular account that I want to work with, I've got to set up things. You can automate all of that just like you would for a test, but do enough to get you to the point that you're working on, the new place, the edge of the world that hasn't been written yet, and save yourself the time involved in logging in and going through that whole manual process. You just run the script, a few seconds later you're there and ready to go. You don't have to do it manually. right? And uh, one of the things that I like to, so automated work point. One of the things I like to do is, um, if I'm working on a project, and, and for the last however long I've been working on this stuff, um, I build war files with Java code. Those have to get deployed to a server, so I have to stop the server, clean out the, uh, the temporary directories, copy my files over, start the server again, and, and go. And it's a pain, but if you automate that process, you know, you start the script, you go off, you grab some coffee, and when you come back, everything's running again, and you're ready to test your new process. Right, so things that you can do to make yourself more productive by taking tools that you're currently using and just using them in a slightly different way. So that's about it. Um, if you've got any questions, I, I'll take them now. Uh, if not, here's contact information. Um, you can get a hold of me at berkhoffnagel at darty.com. Uh, I don't send a lot of tweets, but if you want to, you can look at, at Twitter. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I, I do a lot of Java programming, and I'm one of the directors for the Atlanta Java User Group. Uh, we have a conference coming up in a couple months called DevNexus. It's more server-side stuff and all. But uh, we also have, conference, have uh, uh, sessions on JavaScript, mobile development, all that sort of stuff there, too. Um, questions? I've answered all your questions? No, come on. No? Okay. Well, 